Hey folks, welcome to Atomic Game Theory, the show that uses conflict theory and math to study the tiny decisions that can make the big differences between winning and losing your favorite games. You've all been with me through five episodes filled with some of my favorite games and a lot of my favorite math, but I can sense there are probably some basic questions out there still. So let's start with one of the important ones. What exactly is game theory? You've watched Star Wars, right? So you know that our favorite protocol droid is always out there chiming in with some of his big predictions. In A New Hope, C-3PO claims that the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. And math-hating Han Solo says, never tell me the odds! Well, if he had listened to 3PO, Han would have had the chance to study some rudimentary game theory. Game theory is all about finding the probabilities and chances of specific risks and rewards to find the most viable outcome for you. Does that sound like you're basically making a pros and cons list? It should, but usually you're not the only person making decisions. Game theory found its start with poker, as players looked for betting guidelines to win as many chips as possible. Players began to develop strategies like, you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them, and other important mathematical songs. But it took until the 1920s before game theory really became a subject of serious study. The most recognizable face in game theory is Russell Crowe, because back in 2001, he got to play the incredible John Nash in A Beautiful Mind. I like to talk about Nash because he came up with the idea of an equilibrium, which is a solution set to the brand of game theory I like the most. John Nash was a pioneering mathematician who wrote his PhD thesis on non-cooperative games in 1950. And while non-cooperative sounds a lot like a type of game you'd find on your shelf, Nash received a Nobel Prize in economics for his achievements. Because when you get deep into the details of game theory, you find out that we're really talking about nations. Coalitions of people with allies and enemies on the world's biggest stage, or corporations trying to have the highest stock price after a day of trading. In fact, the most well-known game theory simulation, The Prisoner's Dilemma, was initially developed to study global nuclear strategy. Folks, we are worlds away from Settlers of Catan. So if this isn't about fun, why would you name this theory after a game? Well, because what they really meant by game was conflict simulation, which is much less fun. In that case, it might help if we started asking, what is a game? Let's start with a game that I spent way too much time playing in college when I should have been writing essays, Pyramid Solitaire. Now this is clearly a game, right? I mean, duh, it comes in the games folder of your computer. Call it what you want, but even if I can think about Pyramid Solitaire in the same way that C-3PO talks about that asteroid field, neither one of them is really a game in a useful way. Game theory requires multiple players who can make decisions. End of story. So no matter how well shuffled that deck of cards is, we wouldn't call it sentient. Okay, fine, so what if we're both playing Pyramid and whoever finishes first gets a victory point? That has to be a game, right? Nope, that's just a race. Game theory is all about opposing strategies, so I need to consider what decisions you could make based on the decisions I make. In a race, your decisions never affect my own, so in a game theoretic sense, a race cannot be a game. So what does a game actually entail? Let me go ahead and give you my definition, and this is the one I'll be using throughout this series. A game is a simulated conflict where two or more players make strategic choices about how best to gain advantage over their opponents. If these are the kind of games I'm looking at, then I can always do some basic game theory to lay out my options. Next question, what is an atom, and why is this show called Atomic Game Theory? I love this word. It's been kicking around for a few thousand years since the folks back in Greece and India started studying the nature of things. The Greeks fell upon the word atomon, meaning uncuttable or indivisible and theorized that all matter was simply made up of different organizations of these atoms. Two and a half thousand years later, we're starting to talk about subatomic particles, but let's just steer clear of that. To early Greeks like Democritus, an atom was the smallest unit of matter. And I think it's a little poetic to think that all these big things are just made up of smaller things. And I'm not the only one who feels that way. Enter the book that all of you should purchase right now, Characteristics of Games. There's a link on the screen. Go ahead, click it. I'll wait. Okay, if you've looked at the cover of Characteristics of Games, you should see a very familiar name, Richard Garfield. Remember him? He created a little game called Magic the Gathering. After designing a bunch of other games, including personal favorites like the great Dalmudi and Robo Rally, Garfield began an in-depth study of the games that we know and love. Garfield took an approach straight out of biology. Study the things that make games unique in order to develop patterns and classifications. One of the problems in comparing games is that they have all sorts of different lengths. If a game of rock, paper, scissors only lasts four seconds, how do you compare that with something like StarCraft? Garfield settled on the idea of an atom as a unit of measurement for games. He said that an atom is the smallest complete unit of play you can make in a game. So you might play 20 hands of hearts in a row, but there comes a moment where you have had a satisfying unit of play. 
Garfield calls that an atom. But when you think about the strategy needed to win a game, an atom is just too big. Garfield is interested in studying games and classifying them into a huge taxonomical worldview. What I'm interested in is much smaller. I want to meld together these atomic and game theoretic concepts. For what we're doing here, an atom is the smallest complete unit of a strategy, a single moment of decision during a conflict which is really just a fancy way of describing a choice. Every single choice you make during a game is worthy of study and analysis, whether that's the way you trade bricks for sheep in Settlers of Catan, or the way you defend in Twilight Imperium, or even the way you draft cards in Seven Wonders. By using game theory to study these small atomic choices, we can create the strategies that lead us ever closer to victory. And that's it. That's how you start thinking like a game theorist. Thanks for watching. Gotta get serious.